All right, well, let's just go ahead and open with a word of prayer, and then um, uh, this is kind of a atypical Wednesday. We're right in the middle of a scholarly meeting, so we've been giving presentations all day. So I'm going to open in prayer, and then the executive director of this group, the Council on Dispensational Hermeneutics, will come up and say a few words. And then he'll introduce our speaker for tonight. <laughs> so let's pray. Father, we're just grateful for this evening, uh, grateful for the chance to fellowship. And as our custom, we're going to pause just for a few moments of silence so we can uh, exercise 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, so we can be in a right position with you by way of fellowship so that we can receive from your word tonight. Lord, we're thankful for our eternal security, but we do recognize that sometimes we can fall out of fellowship with you, and we're grateful for the promise of 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, where broken fellowship can be restored. So I just pray that you'll be with us this evening and that in all things you'll be glorified. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said... Amen. Let me introduce to you for a couple of comments, uh, Dr. Michael Stollard. I don't think we have any more. Um, Brother Jim might be able to help you with that. I don't know. Well, good evening to all of you. Thank you for... Uh, letting us uh, kind of uh, encroach a little bit on your church. And uh, we uh, are the Council on Dispensational Hermeneutics. It's a group that started in 2008. Uh, it started out of, a, I was in a debate uh, at the Evangelical Theological Society. Uh, and leaving that debate, I came to the conclusion that traditional dispensationalists, like uh, what this church stands for, we do not have a place uh, or a co conference, a discussion group we get together and talk about the issues with ourselves. We're going to all these other meetings where we talk to all the other people and bat things around. We need a place where we can talk together ourselves. And so we started uh, the, the conference back in 2008, and we meet annually every year in September. We were supposed to be here last September, and uh, Nicholas came through and uh, blew us away. So we ended up on Zoom instead, so we were not able to come uh, be with you folks and uh, we uh, wanted to come back and one of our goals has been to always establish uh, smaller one-day conferences uh, around the country and uh, we still have our annual two-day conference so this year it's going to be uh, in September in San Diego very beautiful city uh, we'll be at the Southern California Seminary uh, David Jeremiah's seminary uh, and uh, our topic is going to be does dispensationalism matter and uh, we're going to have about 14 or 15 papers and speakers and a good discussion uh, with that. But we, we've had four speakers for today, while well, the last one, the fourth one to come here in just a second. But I just wanted to share with you a little background of who we are. And again, just say thank you. Thank you for dinner. Uh, and I'm going to have to sleep now through Andy's presentation. Uh, but thank you for the, the dinner that was given. And we just want to thank you for your hospitality. And it's good to be I'm, I'm, I live in western Philadelphia area, uh, although I'm a southern boy from Alabama, and I lived in Texas for 13 years. And it's just, I'm just glad to be back in a free state for a while. So, uh, so Lord bless you. Andy, you come and share. All right, very good. Well, thank you. If you could open your Bibles to the book of Revelation. Chapter 1 and verse 3. Um, if you have a copy of the paper, the title is wrong. So how's that for an opening? It's supposed to be apocalyptic literature and hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, as you probably know, is the 
uh, science and art of interpretation. And I'm not going to read my paper. I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation that goes along with the paper. But this is the Council of Dispensational Hermeneutics. And what is dispensationalism? It has three parts to it. You'll notice part number one is the consistent, and that's a very important word, the consistent use of the plain, normal, literal, grammatical, historical method of interpretation. And so what I want to show uh, in this particular presentation is how the subject of genre, although well-intentioned, is actually posing a challenge to that first point in the area of something called apocalypticism or apocalyptic genre. So what is genre? Well, genre is a French word. Um, it means species or kind. And it's the idea that as you look at the Bible, there's different styles of literature. You know, when you read Romans, it's kind of different than reading Ezekiel. Amen. Uh, you know, we have epistolary literature, Romans, you have um, uh, uh, legal, like the book of Deuteronomy, poetic, like the book of Psalms or the book of Job, uh, etc. And then you have something called apocalyptic. Now, so far, so good. I think everything I've said before, we would all be comfortable with. The Bible has different um, styles as you read through it. So Charles Ryrie is very comfortable with genre. Charles Ryrie specifically notes that literalism, which is the first plank in dispensational thought, does not preclude or exclude a correct understanding of types, illustrations, apocalypses, or other genres within the basis, basic framework of literal interpretation. So we believe that genre can be extremely helpful in understanding it. However, what I want to show in this presentation is the subject of genre, particularly in the area of something called apocalyptic literature, is being pushed too far. It is being used, particularly in academic circles, to suspend the ordinary rules of interpretation in books of the Bible, like the book of Revelation. Um, there's a, a tool, uh, kind of a designation that some use to describe this. It's called genre override, where the concept of genre is actually overriding the plain statements in the biblical text. And I think this is being particularly done particularly in academic circles today in the area of eschatology, which is the study of the end. So in 1994, Dr. John Walvoord was asked, what do you predict will be the most significant theological issues over the next 10 years? He responded, quote, the hermeneutical problem of not interpreting the Bible literally, especially the prophetic areas. The church today is engulfed in the idea that one cannot interpret prophecy literally. And what I want to do is take Dr. Walvoord's statement and, and expose how this is actually happening in the area of Bible prophecy, those parts of the Bible dealing with the future. So with that being said, here's an outline that I'm going to seek to follow. Um, as, we, as, we, as we work our way through this. So I'm going to start off with what I would call the new approach, which I think is the wrong approach to Bible prophecy. 
And then towards the end of this, in part two, I'll get to the traditional approach or what I think is a, an accurate approach. And again, we're dealing with the issue of interpretation in the area of Bible prophecy. So I think it was Ralph Alexander, was it, in 1968, who wrote a doctoral dissertation on apocalyptic literature. He said there's a certain genre in the Bible that he called apocalyptic. And he began to develop a common cluster of characteristics of that literature from within the Bible. Now here's a statement from Dr. Pentecost kind of summarizing these, this genre called apocalyptic. Uh, Dr. Pentecost, who is my professor, said apocalyptic literature in the Bible has several characteristics. Symbols or signs is a big issue, like what you have in the book of Revelation. Uh, there's a great emphasis on the future of the nation of Israel, like what we're studying here on Wednesdays, the book of Zechariah. Examples of apocalyptic genre in the Bible, according to this definition, are Daniel, Revelation, Ezekiel, Zechariah. And then Dr. Pentecost writes, in interpreting the visions, symbols, and signs in apocalyptic literature, one is seldom left to his own ingenuity to discover the truth. In other words, when you run into a sign or symbol in apocalyptic literature, you don't have to rely upon your sanctified imagination as to what it means because there's rules in place, and I'll share some of those with you, that will give you a concrete ident identification of what that particular sign or symbol is. So that whole uh, framework, I think, is very workable. If that's all people meant by apocalyptic literature... Uh, I, I would have no problems with it. The problem relates to the fact that when you throw out the word apocalyptic, an older generation means one thing by it. The generation of younger scholars means something, to them it means something completely different. So let me give you kind of the new definition that I think is problematic, that I think is challenging literal interpretation uh, more than any other single thing I could think of in the subject of eschatology or prophecy. When the current crowd uses the concept or the words apocalyptic, they're talking about the apocalyptic books that are outside the Bible. Examples would be the book of Enoch, the apocalypse of Baruch, Jubilees, the Assumption of Moses, Psalms of Solomon. Have you had any of your devotional time in any of these books lately? No, because they're outside the Bible. The Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, uh, the Sibylline Oracles. And what they're arguing is these books pre present a common cluster of characteristics. So they were typically written around 200 BC to AD 100. They feature angels as interpreting guides. They're written during a time of intense persecution. There's a vivid use of symbols and images. There's a struggle between good and evil. Uh, vision is used as a means of revelation. There's a focus upon the current age and inauguration of the age to come. There's dualism between God and Satan. There's a spiritual order determining human history, and they're pessimistic about man's ability to change the progress of events. And so what people are saying is, hey, the book of Revelation is just like these. And oh, by the way, look at the date. Uh, 200 BC to AD 100, that's, you know, that's roughly the date of the book of Revelation, AD 95. So what I want you to see is this is a different, different definition of apocalyptic. This is not developing uh, a genre from within the canon 
of scripture the way Ralph Alexander was developing it. It's developing a genre from outside the biblical canon, from uninspired books. And once that hermeneutic or method of interpretation is developed, it's then read into the book of Revelation. And once you do that, it's a game changer. Um, the, your hermeneutic or your method of interpretation for the book of Revelation completely changes. Now, personally, I think these folks are going the wrong direction. They're going to uninspired writings to understand an inspired writing, the book of Revelation. Whereas, by my way of thinking, these books here are just pagan imitations of the book of Daniel, which was written 400 years before these books came on the scene. So when, when, when people talk about genre today, it's not so much in this area developing characteristics from within the canon, it's going outside the canon, developing a method of interpretation and reading it back into the Bible when these books, I think, are nothing more than pagan imitations of the book of Daniel. And once you move in this direction, it's a game changer hermeneutically because four hermeneutical doors open that normally would be shut. So let me give you those four hermeneutical doors very briefly if I could. Number one, it becomes impossible to interpret the book of Revelation literally. So one of the big proponents of this is a man named Kenneth Gentry. And he writes, before beginning my survey, I must note what most Christians suspect and what virtually all evangelical scholars uh, recognize, and notice he puts in parenthesis, excluding classic dispensationalists. So who are the classic dispensationalists? That's us. So what he's saying is we're not sophisticated in this new area of apocalypticism. Regarding the book of Revelation. Revelation is, high, is a highly figurative book. I agree with that. It is highly figurative. But he says, because it's highly figurative, we cannot approach it with a simple, straightforward literalism. That part of it I, I disagree with. Here's another example of this apocalyptic mindset. This is Brian McLaren of the Emergent Church. Emergent Church. He says, the book of Revelation is an example of a popular literary genre of ancient Judaism known as Jewish apocalyptic. Trying to read it without its genre would be like watching Star Trek or some other science fiction show thinking it was a historical documentary. Instead of being a book about the distant future, it becomes a way of talking about the challenges of the immediate present. So the book of Revelation is not about the future, according to Brian McLaren, it's about the present. And he thinks it's about the present because of this apocalyptic category. Um, Steve Gregg, another advocate of this approach, says an, another obvious similarity between the apocalypse and its uninspired counterparts. So what he's doing is he's just lumping Revelation in with all of those other uninspired books is the use of vivid images and symbols. Literal and less absurd, though this is a good rule when dealing with literature written in a literal genre, it is the exact opposite in the case of apocalyptic literature where symbolism is the rule and literalism is the exception. So based on this apocalyptic category, uh, literal interpretation of the book of Revelation doesn't work. In a famous book called The Language and Imagery of the Bible, J.B. G. B. Caird says, and this is very important to, to see these quotes just to grasp their mindset, eschatology is a metaphor. The application of the end of the world language to that which is not literally the end of the world. 
So you go through the book of Revelation and it, gosh, it looks to me like it's talking about things that haven't happened yet. Uh, the world's, half the world's population is destroyed. The sea turns to blood. You've got the greatest earthquake in history. You've got the great city of Babylon, you know, reigning over the kings of the earth. And according to this apocalyptic mindset is all this is, is crisis literature. It's hyperbole designed to communicate a problem. So it's like saying in their minds, I just, I just lost my job. The world has come to an end. You know, the world has not literally come to an end, but that's how you feel at the moment when you lose your job. That's their mindset, um, developing this hyperbolic understanding of things from these non-canonical books. Now, if you believe that, then what comes roaring to the forefront is the doctrine of preterism. Preterism means past. And a preterist basically looks at the book of Revelation and says it already happened. Why would they think that? Well, it's about Rome invading the land of Israel in AD 70, they say. Well, then how do you explain all of these things in the book about the sea turning to blood and all of these things? And they say, well, that's just hyperbolic. So let me just give you a few quotes on this. Kenneth Gentry says, the preterist approach, the preterist view does understand Revelation's prophecies as strongly reflecting actual historical events in John's near future. What was in John's near future? The Roman invasion of Israel. But these are set in, look at the language, apocalyptic drama and clothed in poetic hyperbole. So his hermeneutic doesn't work unless he moves into this apocalyptic classification. Uh, R.C. Sproul, who basically is of the same mindset, he believes, well, I don't know what he believes now. He's, he's dead and he's in the presence of the Lord. So hopefully he got straightened out a little bit. But when he was alive, he basically believed that the book of Revelation already happened, preterism. And he writes, Russell and Calvin agree that the language em employed in biblical prophecy is not always cold and logical as is common in the Western world, but adopts a kind of fervor common in the East. So he again is relying on this apocalyptic hyperbole to get his system to work. Uh, Don Preston, who's a full preterist, and you ask him, Don, how did the greatest earthquake in human history in the book of Revelation, how did that already happen? And look at what he says here. He says, apocalyptic literature hyperbolizes the destruction of Jerusalem according to the Sibylline oracles. So he's going to the non-canonical books to develop this hermeneutic. The whole creation was shaken when war began on Jerusalem. Um, Robert Thomas, who I think has it right, critiques these guys and he says, a preterist approach must assume an apocalyptic genre in which the language only faintly and indirectly reflects the actual events. This extreme allegorical interpretation allows for finding fulfillments in the first century Roman Empire prior to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So what is happening in academia all over the place is we're losing dispensationalism because we're told we can't interpret the book of Revelation literally. And the excuse that's being given is revelation is apocalyptic, as I'm describing it. They do the exact same thing with Babylon. We've talked a little bit about Babylon today and in some of our sessions. As you read Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 50 and 51 where Babylon's destruction is analogized to Sodom and Gomorrah. And it talks about 
once Babylon is destroyed, nothing will be, her building materials will never be used again. That definition of Babylon's destruction does not fit the known facts of history. Because when Babylon actually fell to the Medes and the Persians in 539 BC, there wasn't even a battle. The Persians tunneled under the walls of Babylon and conquered the Babylonians without even a war. That doesn't fit Babylon's destruction as given in the book of Isaiah, nor the book of Jeremiah. And virtually any historical source that you consult will tell you that. So then if those prophecies have never been fulfilled, when are they going to be fulfilled? Well, they're going to be fulfilled in the book of Revelation. Chapter 17 and 18, when Babylon is brought back to life and destroyed in the seventh bowl judgment. So Dr. John Walford says, as far as the historic fulfillment is concerned, it's obvious from both scripture and history that these verses have, no, have, have not been uh, literally fulfilled. The city of Babylon continued to flourish after the Medes conquered it, though its glory dwindled, especially after the control of the Medes and the Persians ended in 323 BC. The city continued in some form or substance until AD 1000 and did not experience a sudden termination such as anticipated in this prophecy, Isaiah and Jeremiah. That's why so much of Jeremiah's prophecies about Babylon shows up in Revelation 17 and 18. If God means what he says and says what he means, then Babylon has to be brought back to life to be destroyed cataclysmically the way Isaiah and Jeremiah uh, call for. Now, what people do with that is they say, well, come on, you're being overly literal. Don't you know that Isaiah and Jeremiah are a special kind of genre that features hyperbole? So Homer Heater wrote a Jets article about this and he called it a destruction genre. And he said Isaiah and, and Robert Chisholm in his handbook of the prophets follows what Heater says here. And essentially what Heater was arguing is that the language of Isaiah 13 and 14 is stylized and exaggerated. And when Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians in 539, yeah, it wasn't fulfilled exactly, but it was essentially fulfilled. So what I'm trying to communicate here is this is a massive hermeneutical door that opens. The moment you take prophetic books and say they're just like the non-canonical apocalyptic books. In those non-canonical ap apocalyptic books, hyperbole is the norm. And people are saying that's exactly what's going on in the book of Revelation. The second hermeneutical door that opens once you move into this apocalyptic category is something called apocalyptic multivalence. Which is the idea that prophecies have multiple fulfillments. So J.J. Collins writes, in other, in other Jewish apocalypses, so he's going outside of the biblical canon to develop this mindset. The Babylonian crisis of the 6th century often provides the filter through which later crises are viewed. The emphasis is not on the uniqueness of the historical events, but on recurring patterns which assimilate the particular crisis to some event of the past, whether historical or mythical. So you ask someone that's wrapped up in this hermeneutic, who do you think the beast of Revelation is? I mean, is the beast Nero? Is the beast Adolf Hitler? Is the beast a future antichrist? And they would say all of the above. Because this is the nature of apocalyptic literature. Is prophecies keep getting fulfilled over and over and over again. 
So they're, they're abandoning a principle that I'll share with you in a moment called single meaning. Robert Thomas critiques progressive dispensationalists who are very involved in this new hermeneutic. He writes, Blazing and Bach interpret Babylon in Revelation 17 as representing Rome and rebuilt Babylon on the Euphrates. And in addition to, in addition, the sweep of history, it could represent any city. Since the world's empire's center is always shifting. So you ask someone wrapped up in this, who do you think Babylon is in Revelation 17 and 18? Is it Jerusalem that fell to Rome in AD 70? Is it Rome itself that fell? Is it Las Vegas? Is it San Francisco? Is it a future Babylon on the Euphrates River? And they'll say, yes, it's all of the above. Because that's the nature of apocalyptic literature. Now, once you go down that road, you have to understand that you're abandoning a basic hermeneutical principle called single meaning. Milton Terry correctly explains, quote, a fundamental principle in grammatico historical exposition is that words and sentences can have but one significance in one and the same connection. The moment we neglect this principle, we drift upon a sea of uncertainty and conjecture. Uh, take, for example, Isaiah 53, which is a prophecy about Jesus 700 years in advance. I mean, how was that prophecy fulfilled? It wasn't fulfilled multiple times. It was fulfilled singularly in the person of Jesus Christ. And if you were to take Isaiah 53 and argue it's apocalyptic, what you come up with is this multivalence, multi-fulfillments mindset. So that's hermeneutical door number two that opens. And what I'm trying to show you is why I'm bringing this up, why this issue is significant. The third hermeneutical door that opens are what are called code theories. Revelation 17 and 18 mentions Babylon the Great. Now, who is Babylon the Great? Are you ready for this? Babylon the Great means Babylon the Great. It means a city in Iraq that will be restored to life in the last days. And when you argue that, people would say, no. This is apocalyptic literature. And in apocalyptic literature, Babylon, in the Sibylline Oracles, for example, is used as a code for Rome. So when you read the name Babylon in Revelation 17 and Revelation 18, you're supposed to understand that as a code for Rome. Even though all of the other areas of geography in the book of Revelation, whether it's Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, the Euphrates, etc., are always literal places. Not so Babylon, we're told. Because Babylon is a code for Rome. Now, why is Babylon a code for Rome? Well, we've got to go to the outside, non-canonical books, develop a hermeneutic, and read that back into the Bible. So F.F. F. Bruce writes concerning the title on the harlot's forehead. The title on her forehead, Babylon the Great, is read, but Rome is meant. I mean, look at that sentence again. Babylon the Great is read, but Rome is meant. So you, do you see the word Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18? Just cross it out and write in the word Rome. Why would you do that? Because this is apocalyptic literature. And in apocalyptic literature, Babylon is used as a code. So obviously that's what John is, is revealing in the book of Revelation 17 and 18. Robert Thomas says another clear distinctive of literal interpretation is its avoidance of assumptions not justified in the text. Theories that Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18 is a code for Rome have been widespread. And what he's saying is when you go down this road, you're departing from 
the literal grammatical historical method of interpretation. You're being influenced by ideas from outside the text instead of simply reading what the text says. By the way, I like what Henry Morris writes here. He says, Paul was not afraid to speak directly against Rome in his writings. I mean, he must not have been afraid to use the word Rome because we have a whole book in the Bible called the book of Romans. So why should John be? Um, you know, this idea that they're trying to disguise Rome and not mention Rome and Babylon is a code word for Rome, that doesn't make any sense because none of the other biblical writers ever do that. But you're expected to read Revelation 17 and 18 that way, the more sophisticated you become in this area of apocalyptic genre or literature. Here is a fourth um, hermeneutical door that opens when you move into this apocalyptic category. You begin to see numbers as concepts and not as count units. Steve Gregg, who's wrapped up in all of this, writes, as in other apocalypses, what other apocalypses? The ones outside the Bible. Certain numbers in Revelation convey more than count units. The most evident of these is seven, the number of completeness or perfection. So when people um, go to the book of Revelation, they have no problem today not taking the numbers literally. So here's David L. Turner, a progressive dispensationalist, and he writes, perhaps the absence of oysters large enough to produce such pearls in the, in the absence of sufficient gold to pave such a city is viewed as sufficient reason not to take these images as fully literal. The preceding discussion serves to warn against a hyper-literal approach to what? Apocalyptic imagery. So you see the name calling? Um, if you look at the city that's described in the eternal state, the New Jerusalem, in Revelation 21 and 22, you're not supposed to take those dimensions literally because that's not how apocalyptic literature functions. You're not supposed to take the streets of gold literally because we all know there's not enough gold in the world to create streets of gold, as if that's some kind of problem for God, I guess. And you're not allowed to take the pearls that are mentioned on the city gates, literally, because we don't have oysters large enough to make pearls of that size. And we all know that this is all meant to be hyper, hyperbolic anyway, because this is, he says it right at the end of the quote, apocalyptic imagery. And it's amazing what they do with the number 1,000 in Revelation 20, which is mentioned six times concerning the length of the Messianic kingdom. Kenneth Gentry says the proper understanding of the thousand year time frame in Revelation 20 is that it is representative of a long and glorious era and is not limited to a literal 365,000 days. The figure represents a perfect cube of 10, which is the number of quantitative perfection. Now I thought First of all, seven was the number of perfection, so he fudged a little bit. Suddenly, ten is the number of perfection. Ten cubed is ultimate perfection. And so when you read Revelation 20 and you see Jesus coming back and launching a thousand-year kingdom, you're not meant to understand that as a literal thousand-year kingdom. It's just speaking of a long and glorious era, even though it says a thousand years six times. Uh, Dr. Daryl Bach, in his summary essay, Three Views on the Millennium, if you want the page numbers, pages 303 to 305, is on record saying he does not believe that the millennial kingdom will last exactly a thousand years. He believes in a millennial kingdom. He's premillennial. He's just sort of up in the air whether it's really a thousand years. I have no problem believing it's a thousand years because that's what the Bible says. 
But my approach would be looked at as naive because I wouldn't be demonstrating sophistication with all of these non-canonical apocalypses. I agree with what Robert Thomas says in his commentary on Revelation. I think he's got it right. No number in Revelation is verifiably a symbolic number. It's all there to be understood literally. So this is why I'm contending that this apocalyptic category is undermining the first plank of dispensationalism, which is a consistent literal grammatical historical method of interpretation. They're, they're basically saying you can't do that because this is an apocalyptic category. What are some weaknesses to this approach? Look at what Charles Feinberg says. He says when he sets forth his doctrine of the millennial kingdom, and he wrote this uh, some time back, he says it's not based upon secular or apocryphal literature. He calls those perverted works extraneous to the Bible. Such sources yield nothing to a biblical study of the question of the millennium. So you wonder why someone in an older generation like Feinberg interprets Revelation differently than the current group. It has to do with how much room you're going to give to this apocalyptic understanding. So this chart here, I think it's of um, this lumping Revelation in with the apocalyptic works is flawed because, yeah, there are some similarities between Revelation and these non-canonical books, but look at all the differences. They never talk about the differences. Apocalyptic literature is pseudonymous, meaning they're forgeries. Enoch did not write the book of First Enoch. Someone pretending to be Enoch wrote First Enoch. Not so the book of Revelation that John wrote. Apocalyptic literature is pessimistic about the present. Book of Revelation is not pessimistic about the present because the Lamb has broken into human history. Apocalyptic literature has no epistles associated with it. The book of Revelation does. Revelation 2 and 3. Now here's a big one. Apocalyptic literature doesn't tell people to repent frequently. The book of Revelation does. Apocalyptic literature makes Messiah's coming exclusively future, not the book of Revelation. It talks about how the Lamb has broken into history 2,000 years ago, and he's coming back. Apocalyptic literature does not call itself prophecy. The book of Revelation does. Apocalyptic literature doesn't predict the future. It's basically written by someone after the historical events happened, Pretending it's a futuristic prophecy. The book of Revelation, by contrast, makes predictions about the future. Apocalyptic literature concerns a future generation only. The book of Revelation is concerned with John's rev generation, Revelation 2 and 3, and a future generation as well. So that, I think, is an approach that we should reject because if you do that, you will lose dispensationalism. So what is a better approach to this? Um, as long as we're confused on this word apocalyptic, my preference is to call the book of Revelation prophecy. Maybe you can come up with a word like prophetic apocalyptic or something like that. Why is that? And that's why I had you open up to Revelation 1 verse 3. So we're just getting to the message right now. Everything else was an introduction. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. Book of Revelation calls itself prophecy, I think, 18 times. The book of Revelation functions like prophecy. Prophecy. It gives, like all of these other prophets that I have men mentioned here on the screen, a glimpse of the future, comforting God's people in the present, 
are calling God's people in the present to repent. The book of Revelation is doing the exact same thing. By the way, Jesus called Daniel a prophet. He said in Matthew 24, verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken through Daniel, the what? The prophet. And everybody thinks the word apocalypse, ellipsis, means apocalyptic literature. It does not. Apocalypsis, which is where we get the English translation, the revelation, simply means a disclosure. That's what that word means. It has almost nothing to do with the modern understanding of apocalyptic literature as I've tried to describe it. So when you move in this direction, what you begin to see is, you know what? I'm going to interpret the book of Revelation exactly like I do any other part of the Bible. I'm going to take the text at face value unless there's something conspicuous in the text to tell me not to take it at face value. So that's a consistent use of the literal, grammatical, historical method of interpretation. And you move in that direction when you start to see Revelation as something different than these other non-canonical apocalypses. The four hermeneutical doors that I just described, those slam shut once you object to this apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic category. Robert Thomas says in his commentary on the book of Revelation, he says, because in a broad perspective, the apocalypse is prophetic in nature as is the rest of the New Testament. Therefore, a different set of hermeneutical principles is not needed to interpret it. What, what's happening today is people are coming up with all of these novel hermeneutical principles for interpreting Revelation because of this apocalyptic category. So when it says half of the world's population will be destroyed, the sea will turn to blood, the greatest earthquake in human history will occur, the great city will reign over the kings of the earth, that's exactly what it means. Which slams the door on preterism because it's obvious that these things have never happened yet. So I know what a lot of you are asking me, oh, come on, Andy, uh, the book of Revelation has a lot of symbols in it. I mean, you're, you're telling me we can interpret those symbols using a literal, grammatical, historical method of interpretation. And I'm saying yes, because language only comes in two forms. It's either plain, literal, sometimes called denotative, or figurative literal, sometimes called connotative. So my wife asked me, how did you sleep last night? And I say, well, I slept, I slept great. I slept in until 8.30 a.m. And I slept like a log. So when I do that, I just use both styles of speaking, denotative and connotative. When I say I slept in until 8.30, she understands that in a denotative sense. When I say I slept like a log, the like is a what? Simile, so I'm communicating to her a metaphor of sorts. She doesn't think that I turned into a piece of wood in the middle of the night, even though our last name is Woods. <laughs> And what's interesting about these two kinds of language is sometimes you can get them confused. So one time, um, I and this happens more as you get older, I put a cup of coffee in the microwave and I forgot it was there. And it started to kind of boil over. And I was in the office and my wife was in the kitchen and she said, honey, your cup is running over. And I said, you know, you're right. My cup is running over. I'm blessed. I'm happy. 
She says, no, your cup is running over. So that would be a confusion of denotative versus connotative. That confusion can, can occur. But generally speaking, when you're reading the book of Revelation, there's clues in the text telling you when a figure of speech is in play. So here's some things to look for. You look for um, adverbs like spiritually. The word sign, I think uh, Dr. Stoller brought that up. The words like or as. You look for Old Testament correspondence. The four beasts in Revelation 13 verse 2. Lion, bear, etc. When you understand that those have already been used in the Bible earlier in the book of Daniel to describe nations. We don't interpret those literally. The harlot in Revelation 17, we don't interpret her literally because the end of the chapter calls the harlot a city. And then you could also look for absurdity. Uh, like a woman clothed with the sun and the moon and the 12 stars, Revelation 12. I mean, I don't know if that's literal because if a woman was that close to the sun, she'd burn up. So... What I'm saying is you already do this in other areas of the Bible. It's just in Revelation, it's a little bit more difficult because there's more symbols. But it's the exact same method of literal interpretation. And then once you hit a particular symbol, then there are basic tools available to, to identify what the symbol means. For example, the dragon... In Revelation 12, verse 3, who's the dragon? I don't have to rely upon my sanctified imagination to determine who the dragon is because verse 9 says the dragon is Satan or the serpent. So I hit a symbol because I see the word sign, but then I have a basic rule in place, search the immediate context. And when you do that, you'll see the dragon can be easily understood. Um, I think also you can look for language of comparison. Uh, when John in Revelation 8 verse 8 says he saw a giant mountain on fire plunging into the sea. He uses the expression like or as there. And why does he use the expression like or as? Because you have to sort of put yourself in John's position. Uh, he was told by Jesus, I'm going to give you a vision and just write it down. Write down what you see. And so he has no vocabulary for these future events. So he's just analogizing it to something from his own time period. That's why he keeps saying like or as. It's like uh, Benjamin Franklin Let's say you brought Benjamin Franklin back from the dead and you put him right in Bush International Airport and he sees a plane take off and land. How would he describe it? He has no vocabulary for it. So he would analogize it to something from his own time period. He sees someone checking their email. He would have no vocabulary to describe it. So he analogizes it to something from his own time period. He hears something over the loudspeaker. He would have no vocabulary to describe it. So he analogizes it to something from his own time period. That's all John is doing when he uses this expression like or as. It's John struggling to be obedient to Jesus by recording the vision that he received. So these are all tools that you can use to determine what the symbol means once you figure out a symbol is in play. Um, I think Dr. Stollard covered this. Revelation 12 verse 1 talks about a woman clothed with the sun and the moon and the 12 stars. If you know the Old Testament, the book of Revelation has 404 verses in it. 278 of the 404 are allusions to the Old Testament. The better you know the Old Testament, the better you can understand these symbols. So the woman clothed with the sun and the moon and the 12 stars, if you know Genesis 37, 
And we're teaching the book of Genesis Sunday mornings at, at this church. We're now in Genesis 20. So we may get to Genesis 37 before the rapture. I don't know. But Genesis 37, 9 and 10 um, translates the sun, moon, and the 12 stars. It's Joseph had a dream. He related it to his father. His father rebuked him. And in the process of the rebuke, the dream is explained. Joseph said, I saw the sun and the moon and the 11 stars, Joseph being the 12th, bowing down to me. And Jacob, his father, said, shall I and your mother and your brothers bow down to you? So the sun is Jacob, the moon is Jacob's wife, and the, 12, the 11 stars are Joseph's brother, brothers, Joseph being the 12th star. So the stars would represent the 12 tribes. So the sun and the moon and the 12 stars represents the nation of Israel. So you'll notice that when I came to that particular symbol, and I know it's a symbol because of the word sign, so I'm following one of my uh, signposts here, so to speak. I'm not relying upon my own sanctified imagination to determine what the symbol means. There's basic rules in place where you can figure out, I believe, every single symbol in the book of Revelation. Dr. John Walvoord says the book of Revelation will define itself in the same chapter 26 times. So just be patient with the text and let the text interpret itself. So sort of what I've tried to do in this presentation is talk a little bit about apocalypticism. Um, the old definition was very workable, but the new definition is problematic. By equating the book of Revelation with non-canonical books, because it opens hermeneutical doors that would not normally be open. That approach has weaknesses because of the differences between Revelation and apocalyptic literature. A much better approach is to identify the book of Revelation, if you like the designation prophecy, fine. Maybe prophetic, apocalyptic or something would be fine. But once you say the book of Revelation is a standalone book, it's different than these other non-canonical sources, then the hermeneutical doors that I've tried to explain are closed, and now you're just left with the same consistent literal approach that you use anywhere else in the Bible. Literal until you run into a figure of speech. I've given you some clues as to how to recognize a figure of speech in the book of Revelation. And once you run into it, how to identify these various figures. And why is this a significant issue? I'll leave you with this quote here in my conclusion from uh, Paul Lee Tan in his very, very good book called The Interpretation of Prophecy. He writes, Evangelicals who spiritualize Bible prophecy cannot logically forbid liberals and modernists from spiritualizing selected areas of Christology and soteriology. If evangelicals can spiritualize Christ's earthly kingdom, may not liberals spiritualize the earthly ministry of Christ, including his miracles and resurrection? The same hermeneutical principles used to spiritualize Bible prophecy can be used to spiritualize Christ's first advent. Christians who spiritualize parts of the scripture, such as its prophetic portions, have forfeited a major element of their defense against liberalism. Close quote. In other words, once you let the toothpaste out of the bottle hermeneutically in prophecy, you can take that same non-literal approach and apply it also to other more cardinal areas of the Bible like the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the Trinity, uh, the virgin birth, etc. Which, by the way, is exactly what Michael Lycona, if you followed that controversy, is doing. He's basically arguing that in Matthew 27, the, the folks that came out of the graves, 
you know, when Jesus came out of the grave, it talks about the other Jerusalem saints came out of their graves. Lycona is basically arguing that those folks coming out of their graves is non-literal. Well, why is that? He's calling it apocalyptic literature. So this apocalyptic category in prophecy, he's now applying to resurrected saints in Matthew 27. That's an example of what Dr. Paul Lee Tan is talking about. So that's all I have to say about apocalyptic literature and hermeneutics. So done talking. Okay, we're going to have a time of uh, questions, uh, and I hope some answers. So if you have a question uh, for Dr. Woods. Uh, I'm curious, are, are you saying that um, all of the books that have traditionally been considered apocalyptic should be classified differently? Are you objecting just to the, the idea of genre in general? Or are you saying revelation should be a unique classification? Can, can you just elaborate just a little bit more on, on that yeah. classification? Sure. Yeah. No, I'm not um, rejecting genre. I, I'm not um, rejecting the Ralph Alexander way of doing it, where he's developing genre from within the canon. What I'm objecting to is developing a hermeneutic from outside the Bible and reading it back into the Bible. So I, I have no problem calling Ezekiel, Zechariah, all of them apocalyptic if they're defining it from within the canon, a cluster of characteristics from within the canon. No problem with that. But when the word apocalyptic is thrown out, that's not what's meant today. Does that help at all? Heidi Ho Neighbors. Dr. Andy Woods, I have a question. And my question is, in narrative history, um, there are three kinds of people who have, or who will and who have entered heaven bodily alive. You have Enoch, you have Elisha, and you have the generation of the rapture. Conversely, in Revelations, it says that uh, the Antichrist, the false prophet, will be thrown alive into uh, the lake of fire. So concerning the, the literalism of that, we are to interpret that literally. And has anyone else been thrown alive into the lake of fire? Well, to me, when it says he's thrown in the lake of fire, that's what it means. Um, I don't think anyone is in the lake of fire now because I think the beast and the false prophet are the first two in. And the folks now that die in unbelief are waiting in a place called Hades. So I, I don't think anybody's yet in the lake of fire. Satan himself does not go into the lake of fire until after the millennial kingdom. So it's, it's a place of conscious torment. It's not pleasant. But people that go into it are thrown into it body and soul. That's my understanding. So whether we want to call that literal interpretation, normal interpretation, that's, that's my understanding. Do you see any value from studying or reading those extra canonical books like the Book of Enoch and those others that you talked about? Do you yeah. read them? Yeah, I think they're valuable. I don't think they're essential to your faith and growth as a Christian, but they're like reading, you know, like Josephus, for example, is very valuable. Um, but you can't, you have to use them right. You, you can't elevate them to the same level as an inspired book. You can't 
develop a hermeneutical principles from it and read it back into the Bible. Um, so to, I don't know if that helps at all. And then just one more quick question. I think Daniel was asking about the lake of fire. Is that at, at the very end when Satan and every and the and the bad angels are thrown in? It, is that different than where people that don't know the Lord that die and that are judged at the the great white throne judgment? Is that a different? Do they get thrown someplace else? No, they they are in Hades now. Unbelievers, they'll be resurrected at the great white throne judgment as their names are not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They're transported from Hades into the lake of fire in resurrected bodies where the beast and Satan had already been thrown. And that's bad. Yeah. Bad. My professors forced me to read some of that other stuff, so you guys ought to be forced to read it too. Question is, uh, I know some people just are uh, just out and out against the Bible, but the good men who uh, don't agree on scripture and they look at the same scripture and they come up with these different methods and so forth, how do you account for that? I mean, you know, church split because people don't agree, but in this uh, interpretation of scripture, they read the same scriptures. Is it just that they have different methods of hermeneutics? Or do you think there is something they're promoting themselves or what? But they, are, they seem to be good men. They seem to be saved. How do you account for the differences? Well, I think overall there's been a decline in the belief in the supremacy of the Bible within evangelicalism. So when you look at how, how, for example, Charles Feinberg in his day looked at that issue uh, where he said such sources yielded nothing to the biblical question of the millennium. I mean, that's, um, that's an extremely high view of the Bible. And he's even calling here those other works perverted works extraneous to the Bible. He, doesn't, he, he sees them as imitations of the book of Daniel. That, that mindset has largely disappeared where the Bible is sort of less, something less. And if you see it as something less, then you're open up to understanding it through these other sources. So to me, it's just sort of a devaluing of the authority of the scripture to answer, to answer your question, in my opinion. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, my, my question is, like, for the millennium and Satan, um, I, I'm wondering, is Satan a community organizer, <laughs> so to speak? Because, uh, or is he a catalyst for, for man to sin? Because he was present during Eve. And then he also needs to be loosened for some reason at the end of the millennium. So I'm wondering, is he necessary in some way to, to organize our sin? I know, I know man can sin by himself with, without Satan, but um, it seems like, um, in my mind, it seems like he's a community organizer or a catalyst. You know, he's like a, a necessary ingredient for God's purposes or something. I wonder if you could clarify. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Saul Alinsky in his book, Rules for Radicals, dedicated it to Lucifer. And Saul Alinsky was a community organizer who taught Obama community organization. But I think one of the things to understand about Satan is God uses Satan for God's purposes. So that's, that's the reason why Satan, when Jesus comes back, God doesn't take Satan and throw him into the lake of fire with the beast and the false prophet. He puts him in a different venue 
called the abyss, which is a, I understand it as like a temporary holding place because God is trying to prove at the end of the millennium that man's evil comes from his nature rather than his environment because he's allowed man to live a thousand years under the reign of Christ and yet they hate Jesus, those mortals, at the end of the millennium. And so to prove that and to prove this lesson once and for all, that our problem is not our environment, it's our nature. Uh, Satan has let, the Lord let Satan out of the abyss to stimulate, to tempt man one more time. And he's very successful at it because those involved in the rebellion are as the sand of the seashore. And then once that final pedagogical purpose for Satan is finished, then God says, okay, Satan, you're done. And he takes him and he throws him into the lake of fire. So God, God himself even uses Satan for God's purposes. Um, he actually uses him to teach humanity lessons. And so, you know, you step out, you step back from the ages and you just say, well, you know, how could God take his enemy and use it for God's purposes? And you just throughout the ages just say, praise the Lord. Only God could do that. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yes. No. Questions. <laughs> That's right. That's right. He, and he still hasn't been able to straighten me out yet. No, we're still working on it. Okay. Well, thank you for your time, and Andy, thank you so much okay. for uh, allowing the, us to have the uh, venue of your church. All right. You want to, Mike, close this close in order of prayer? Father, we thank you so much for the opportunities that you give us to... Uh, talk to each other as iron sharpens iron, to learn a little bit more, to go a little bit deeper as we study together. And I pray, Father, you'd help us to study as individuals and not give up on your word easily and help us to keep digging. And we do thank you for the generosity of this church, uh, for the meal that was given, for the venue that was given to the council. We wanna thank you for them. And I ask that you might put your blessing in favor upon this congregation because of that allowance. And I, I pray that you'd all guide us home safely after church tonight, and uh, those of us who have to travel, you'd do watch care over us. Again, we thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.